this, uh, this morning I'd like to take you through a little journey to, to look at the, uh, the historical developments of the horse, to discuss some of the problems we're currently facing with the movement of horses, and then uh, just touch briefly on what uh, Suzanne's already mentioned this morning about the, the, the subpopulation concept. If we look at the history of the transport of the horse, about 6,000 years ago, man first domesticated the horse, possibly initially as a, as a source of food, but then as the strength and the agility of the horse is recognized, it was used increasingly for transport, to hunt game, for warfare, and to be used in the fields. One of the earliest recordings we have of horses being transported was by boat, dating back 3,500 years. And there are many instances of horses being, being moved by boat since the, uh, about 500 BC. However, the first known instance of a horse being shipped by land was the vanning to stud in 1771 of the great British thoroughbred racer, Eclipse. Eclipse could not walk comfortably because of the poor condition of his feet, and so a purpose-built cart was built and used to transport the horse. However, it's not until 1836 that transport of horses in a cart became popular. This was after Lord Litchfield transported his, his horse, Ellis, to the uh, Doncaster uh, races to compete in St. Ledger Stakes. Ellis was stabled some distance from the race course and was considered a rank outsider because in those days, when horses were, were taken to the, uh, the track and they were stabled a long distance from there, by the time they got to the race, they were, they were past their, their peak performance. However, by using the, the uh, horse cart, the horse won easily, and this convinced many trainers of the value of the horse cart for transport. We used uh, uh, rail transport used from the 1820s to the 1950s. Uh, as it's considered cheaper for shipping large numbers of horses. However, it's very noisy and horses often arrive in a very poor state. The first known uh, transport of horse by air was reportedly in the 1920s. And by the 1950s, horses were flying regularly to between Ireland, England and France. The 1960s brought the jet age and with the first carriage of horses in the Boeing 7707. We can see now that horses travel almost in business class in these uh, modified, uh, especially developed uh, jet stalls. When I first became involved in the movement of horses in the late 1990s, it was shipping polo ponies out of Brunei. And then we used a, a wooden crate that was about just over a meter high, and the horses were loaded in there four to a pallet and every time those horses got on that scissor lift to be lifted into the aircraft, my heart was in my mouth wondering why on earth these horses did not jump from that box. Being uh, transported by horse-drawn cart or by boat was slow and laborious, but the advantage was that very few diseases were spread as the horse either died or recovered by the time it reached its destination. As transport has evolved, the distances traveled by horses have, uh, and, and their speed of travel has increased dramatically. So it's now possible to transport horses almost anywhere in the world within 24 to 36 hours. Clearly, this is well within the pre-patent period of most diseases. At the same time as nations developed, the use of the horse as a beast of burden has changed. Now the horse is used increasingly for sport and leisure activities. This has led to marked socioeconomic benefits, as Susanna so eloquently described this morning, with racing nations producing a global industry worth in excess of 100 billion, dollars, 100 billion euros uh, annually. This is just another view of the, of the, of the modified jet store. We can see we can, in the jet store we can fit uh, three horses, um, and uh, they, they travel side by side in, the, in, the, in this, this modified jet store, which looks very, very similar to those luggage containers you see being transported, uh, being taken out to the, the, um, uh, the aircraft as you get on board and you know, flight back to your, your home country. As more nations develop, this trend of increasing use of the horse for sporting activity is going to increase. The world is now a global platform on which people and horses are moving with increasing frequency and rapidity. And this is a trend that's unlikely to reverse. In recent years, however, the growth in international horse pricing has met with a decreased appetite for risk 
among several countries following the 2007 outbreak of influenza in, uh, in Australia. After the outbreak, Australia produced an excellent import risk analysis. Uh, however, the early implementation of that report led to a severe restriction on the movement of horses into Australia. Several other countries also took that opportunity to review their import conditions. We are now facing two problems. Firstly, the existing certificates do not allow readily for new entrants to international racing. And secondly, the decreased appetite for risk has led to several countries reviewing their import conditions with an increasing lack of harmonization in the conditions. The biggest impediment to moving horses internationally currently lies with the wide range of conditions and the, that need to be met in terms of residency and the diseases of concern. Even within the diseases of concern, there are differences in the tests required and the validity of the tests. For example, many countries do not distinguish between temporary and permanent import in their conditions. Residency periods for the temporary movement of horses range from 21 to 180 days. For influenza vaccination, some protocols specify four to six weeks for the primary vaccination. Others, 21 to 42 days. Some rely on manufacturer's recommendations. For some, the primary or booster must be given with 30 to 180 days before import. For others, within 90 days, and for others, within 30 days. So there's a wide range of conditions that need to be met. Some countries require CEM and durine testing, which is essentially d diseases of breeding. And we would question the need for uh, the incorporation of diseases of breeding into horses that are moved uh, temporarily for competition. The question we have to ask ourselves now is how do we find a solution to these problems? I am frequently asked about the construction of quarantines, the wording of health certificates, and other technical matters. And these are important questions. But the quarantines and health certificates are only tools that we use in our biosecurity program. Much like a painter uses a paintbrush to create his painting, we use these tools to create a system within which we can move horses safely. Simply having a paintbrush does not make me a painter. But rather, I must learn to use this tool to create my painting. Similarly, we must learn to use the tools of horse movement to create a system within which we can safely move these horses. There is only one way the system can work effectively to achieve this goal of, of facilitated international horse movement, and that is through cooperation. I can best illustrate this cooperation by introducing you to the Troika. The Russian Troika is a sledge drawn by three horses. It's an integral part of Russian history and its culture. Here we see sledge riding in a Russian Troika in the snow-covered parks in Pushkin in, in uh, St. Petersburg. The only way the sledge can move forward is if all three horses pull in the same direction. And I like to think of the international movement of horses as a sledge drawn by three horses as there are essentially three components in the movement of horses. We have exporting and importing governments, the horse connections, that's the trainers, the owners, the shipping agents, who collectively we can term the equine industry. And thirdly, we have the horse itself. These all must work together to bring about effective international movement of horses. If we look first of all at the importing and exporting governments, through their veterinary services, they evaluate the risk involved in the movement of horses and set the conditions for movement. They are responsible for the monitoring the temporary imported horses and certifying their onward movement. It's essential that importing and exporting governments have horse competent veterinary authorities. This is to say that within the National Veterinary Authority, there needs to be a member or a team that fully understands the need for equine industry and the international movement of horses. We have seen recently instances where a failure within the veterinary, the veterinary authority has led to a closure of the international movement of horses. 
Such examples include Egypt and more recently South Africa, where an inspection by the European Union found deficiencies sufficient to warrant a suspension of movement of horses to Europe and effectively shut down international trade. If we look at the equine industry itself, these horse connections are the owners, the trainers, the shipping agents, and other people involved in the management of the horse. They are responsible for the day-to-day -day care of the horse, for ensuring compliance with the biosecurity requirements, the administration monitoring of medif medif medications, and for the overall health and welfare of the horse. They represent the equine industry, and it's essential that they work with their national veterinary authority to ensure that conditions that are negotiated by the veterinary authorities are implemented. Within the Asian Racing Federation, there are many examples where there is an excellent accord between the equine industry and the national veterinary authority. The third component is the horse itself. The horse is the potential transporter of risk and it must be kept in good health to minimize this risk. The horse is also the benefactor of the health program. It's regularly vaccinated. It's blood tested and monitored for its health. It undergoes performance evaluation and is kept in a biosecurity program. It's readily apparent that these three components cannot work in isolation, but must work together to ensure an effective and safe movement of horses. In countries in which we see an effective troika, we have a strong international movement program in place. Recently, we have seen with the Chengdu Dubai International Cup, the perfect example of the troika in practice. The general administration of quality supervision, inspection, and of quarantine in China, and the Ministry of Environment, Water, and the UAE successfully negotiated a movement protocol to allow horses from Dubai to race in Chengdu, China, and to return home to Dubai afterwards. These movement protocols were discussed with the relevant industry partners, and a set of biosecurity protocols designed to protect both the horse and the countries were derived. The industry partners in both Dubai and Chengdu undertook all the testing of the horses before entering to the two-week pre-export quarantine, repeated the tests in the quarantine, and constantly monitored the health of the horses to ensure that only healthy horses were exported. The whole process was overseen by both officials from the uh, China and the UAE ministries. In the meantime, extensive preparations over many months were made to receive and care for the horses while in China. The horses themselves underwent intensive training and preparation for the event, and also healthcare monitoring for both, uh, prior to both entry into the pre-export quarantine and during the quarantine itself. <clears throat> the monitoring program did not end with the export of horses to China, but was maintained throughout their time in China and after their return to Dubai. It was an intensive program that was desi um, designed to make sure that only healthy horses were moved between Dubai and China and that their health status did not change during the process. It was a remarkable achievement brought about by the tireless efforts of all those that were involved. The World Animal Health Organization, the International Federation of Horse Racing Authorities, and the International Equestrian Federation are currently working on a project, as Suzanne has described this morning, to facilitate the international movement of horses for competition. It's a public-private partnership in which the three components just mentioned must work together to facilitate the trace safe movement of competition horses, including racehorses. This project is called the HHP horse. This project will focus on a select group or subpopulation of high-performance horses. The subpopulation concept, the concept of treating a special class of horse differently from other horses is not new, and in fact has been used and agreed for many years by the European Union. The European Union accepts horses from 56 countries, but only accepts registered horses from 28 of those countries. For the EU, a registered horse is one of a purebred passport or belonging to an international sports horse body, as for example the FEI. It's the opinion of the European Union 
that a registered horse will be kept under better conditions than the non-registered horse. If we look at the classification of HHP horses, we will see that they are all registered horses under the EU definition, as they are either all purebred race horses or FEI competition horses. All that's been done under this proposal is to further restrict this category by adding a performance criteria. We can see that the HHP concept already exists for high performance racehorses, as the European Union has a special certificate for racehorses competing in group or graded races in a select number of countries. Under this HHP proposal, an ad hoc group has been formed by the OIE to look at the science behind the conditions required for temporary movement and will recommend a set of harmonised conditions that will enable these horses to move from one specified competition to another within a, specific, within a time, defined time period. One of the key outcomes of the HHP proposal is to arrive at a set of harmonised conditions for moving these horses internationally for competition. It's based on a public-private partnership that recognises the interdependence of the three elements we've discussed this morning and it assigns responsibilities where they are most appropriately employed. The horse racing industry, for example, uh, recognises that the success of their international horse racing is to a large extent the industry's responsibility and undertakes to ensure that the biosecurity conditions of the agreement are fully met. Similarly, racing also recognises that the cost and resources required to implement this proposal rightfully belong to the industry and will ensure that auditable systems are in place so that competent authorities can monitor the program. So the HHP proposal is not a new concept. As we have seen through the European Union Certificate for Group and Graded Race Horse Races, they can take part in seven different countries, being Australia, Canada, USA, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, or the UAE. We already have a subpopulation of HHP horses and a certificate that facilitates this movement. In effect, we could say that this is a pilot program that has been working effectively for horse racing for more than 15 years. We are asking now that this pilot program be extended in a manner that will benefit all members of the Troika, that's the governments, the horse connections, and the horse itself. If we just now briefly recap on what we discussed this morning. The Distances travelled by horses and the speed of transport has increased dramatically in recent years. As nations develop, there's greater use of the horse for sport and leisure with associated socio-economic benefits. The world is now a global platform on which horses and people are moving with increasing frequency and rapidity. There is a lack of harmonisation of conditions for temporary import of racehorses for competition. It's difficult under existing certificates for new entrants to enter international racing. The subpopulation concept of high performance racehorses already exists. The OIE HHP proposal is simply a means of expanding an existing condition. The HHP proposal is a vehicle to solve the current problems that are hampering growth in the horse racing industry. By working together, governments, horse industry and the horse can all benefit through a win-win-win solution. We have a, a scene from the uh, Dubai uh, quarantine. And, uh, just to finish off. To thank you very much for your attention this morning, and uh, thank you. Thank you.